right, good morning. Can you hear me? It's good. I gotta say, I, I'm liking the uh, song choices uh, this morning with a little Michael Jackson, a little lean on me. I like the way you guys uh, carry your business here. I appreciate that. That was great singing, thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Campbell. I, um, as you heard, I'm a senior organizer uh, with PACT, People Acting for a Community Together. Um, my wife, Tamar, is in the back. Uh, my two sons are out at, um, we're just taken out, but you'll see them running around soon as well. So just want to thank you guys for, for having me here, allowing me to come and speak with you today. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, grassroots organizing. And so an, an important aspect of organizing is understanding stories. It's understanding the story of the area, uh, the community that you're in, understanding the stories of the people around you, and I would say just as important is understanding your own story as well. Like the reading that we had today, we often see ourselves as disconnected and jumbled up pieces. We often don't make the connections of our own stories to those around us. We don't usually see how our experiences fit in the larger picture. We often don't see how our piece fits in that larger puzzle. And over the past few years working with PACT, I've gotten to know many people throughout our, our county, and I've heard many stories. But I was also, I've also done the work of, of uncovering or recovering so many of my own stories and experiences as well. Things that I didn't really understand had such an impact on me. Our stories, our past experiences determine so much of how we approach the world, how we see the world, and often this, this operates at an unconscious level. And so I remember when I, when I first started working with PACT, I heard that I was going to be working on our gun violence campaign. And as I was meeting with different people, I'd often ask them if they'd had experience with gun violence. And sadly, so many people in our county do have tragic stories related to gun violence. But I didn't ever really think about my own answer to this question. You know, because I hadn't lost a brother to gun violence. I hadn't lost a child to gun violence, a best friend. And so even though I had known people who had been shot before, I didn't really think it had that much of an impact on me. I didn't think that gun violence had impacted my life that much. However, as I talked with more people, and as people began challenging me, challenging me about why I came and did this work. As you heard, I was a pastor in Michigan. Why would you move your family cross country why would you change your career? And as people began pushing me and challenging me to answer that question, to dig deeper into my own story, more memories began to bubble up for me. One of those stories that has really stuck out to me during this time and challenged me is, I remember the summer between my, my freshman and sophomore year in college. I was working at the YMCA as a summer youth counselor and one morning on the way to work, I had heard that there had been shooting, a shooting at, the night, at a nightclub the night before and that someone had been shot and killed. Later that day, my friend Chris gave me a call to tell me who the person was. And sadly, it was a former teammate of ours, a former basketball teammate of ours, Daryl, had been shot and killed. The news obviously was shocking to me I was 19 at the time, Daryl was 19 or maybe 20 at the time, and so it's always shocking when, when someone you know passes. It's even more shocking when they're murdered, and it's even more shocking when they haven't even reached their 25th birthday. But I remember wrestling with, with this feeling and, and how I was reacting to Daryl's death, to his murder, because I remember thinking, you know, honestly, I, I wasn't that close with Daryl. We played on the same team, we had a few conversations, but really that was about it. And I remember struggling with how I was feeling and receiving that news because I was, I was struggling with it deeply. 
And I remember his funeral was just a few days later. And it was actually at the church that my father preached at part time. And when I did go to church as a freshman in college, it was the church I would go to. And I remember walking into that church that morning of his funeral and it just being standing room only. I'd never seen the church that packed before. So as I walked into the sanctuary, I looked for a spot to sit. There was no chairs available, no pews available. So I found a spot on the wall to the left side of the church. And I remember feeling strange being there. My grief didn't match the room's grief. There were people keeling over in anguish. And as the service went on, I, I found myself wrestling with two different feelings in particular. The first being that there was this feeling, again, that I, I felt like I, I shouldn't have been there. That because I didn't know him that well, that I couldn't grieve his loss. And this is something in my organizing work I, I have noticed as well, and something that I think we really need to, to confront head on. Because I think often people feel like they can't be a part of something, or they can't grieve a loss, they can't be a part of something that they don't haven't necessarily personally experienced. I hear people talk about, I can't be a part of that organization because nothing's happened to me. Not only is that not true, we all have our stories, we all have had difficulties in our lives, but that mindset is also the mindset of a broken world. This is the mindset of the puzzle piece that has not been connected to the rest of the puzzle. We so often feel like we can't grieve or be a part of one another's lives because we don't see how we connect to one another. And this mindset only serves to keep us disconnected. It only keeps us numb to tragedy. And that numbness leads to indifference, which ends with inaction. And inaction keeps the world broken and disconnected. The other thing that stood out to me that morning while I was standing there was that everyone in the room was clearly grieving the murder of a young 20-year-old black man, but no one was surprised by it. I knew that if I was in a different part of Grand Rapids, if I wasn't in this neighbor neighborhood, then this would have been seen as an unthinkable thing. To be blunt, if, if Daryl was white, this would have been a shocking tragedy instead of an expected one. And this thought has sat with me for 14 years now. And in that moment, I had no clue that it would be something that I'm still reflecting on. No clue that it would be still motivating me to this day. And until a few years ago, I had no clue that it had been. Because what I've come to realize is that in that moment, that day at Daryl's funeral, I made an unconscious decision that whatever I did with my life, it had to be about changing this broken world mindset. It had to be about changing the fact that dying young is expected in so many of our communities. I wanted to be a part of building a world where people like Dee were expected to thrive, not expected to be shot and killed before their 25th birthday. That story, that moment, is a huge part of why I became a pastor and why I do the work I do now. That moment had a huge impact in how I have interacted with people throughout my ministry. That moment was with me in Benton Harbor, Michigan, when I sat with Ayanna Johnson as we cried over her son being murdered by the police. That moment at Dee's funeral, the moments with Miss Johnson drove me into the work that I am doing today. It drove me into the work of grassroots organizing. It drove me into the work of putting the world back together and building a better one together. You see, that's what grassroots organizing is. It is about a community of people coming together to build a better world. And I don't know if this is exactly what you were expecting to hear today. Because so often in this work, when I sit down with people and I talk to them about organizing and doing justice work, they imagine me leading people into the streets and we're doing marches. They imagine leaders giving amazing speeches like Dr. King did. 
And while these things are a part of justice work, they are a part of organizing. These are the outcomes of, of it. But organizing is so much more about connecting our personal stories. When I sit to talk about this work, people so often want to get right down to business. What do we have to do? Let's do a march. Let's do this meeting. Let's do this. I have this idea. But I always encourage people to start with your story. Because when we forget our stories, we forget why we're doing the work in the first place. Because the truth is, organizing, ju doing justice is long, hard work. And if you aren't aware of why you are doing it, you will lose your grounding in it. If you are not grounded in your story and the stories of those around you, you will fall off and lose focus. When I think of some of the major victories, the things we've been able to do with PACT, I have to, we have to remember that every victory took years to accomplish. It took us years to get the county to implement our gun violence reduction strategy. Our housing committee has been working on housing issues for seven years. It took them seven years to do things like reactivate the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and finally get over $20 million put into it. It took us four years to get legislation for community IDs to be passed. And it's been nearly a decade of organizing in order to save over 30,000 children from receiving arrest records for minor crimes. And this isn't just true with PAC, this is with any justice organization, any work of justice. When we look at other examples, this is the case as well. I remember when I first came to Miami and started with PAC, Amendment 4 was a major thing that was voted on in that year, and it was passed. But that was something that had been worked on for years and years, and it's something we're still fighting for even till today. It is our stories are why we are fighting. It is what gives us the endurance to keep fighting. How could I stop fighting when I remember crying with Ayanna Johnson as she talked about her son being murdered outside of that park? How could I stop when I think about Dee having his future taken from him? So before we march, before we gather, before we take action, we hear one another's stories. And from the sharing of our stories, we not only learn more about ourselves, but we begin to learn more about one another. We begin to see ourselves as connected pieces of a larger puzzle. We begin to understand that if we can come together, that if we can align together to build our world and our communities in a way that more closely reflects our deepest human beliefs. Beliefs like that every person has value, that there is more to every person than what we can see. Every person is capable of more than even they know. One of the greatest joys I've had in this work is in organizing is seeing how we turn the world upside down and turn things on their head. I've seen little old church ladies go toe to toe with the mayor. People who thought they would never be able to make a difference. People coming together with people they thought they would never be in the same room with, let alone be on the same side as. This work is about breaking down the barriers and walls and building something better in their place. This is the power of organizing. It is our power. But this is only achieved when we come together and unite for common causes. Our first step is always to listen. Every fall each year, PACT has a listening process. This month, this September, there will be nearly 80 listening sessions that we call house meetings across Miami-Dade County. Nearly 600 people will share deep, personal stories about what they are facing, what they have experienced. And out of that, we will see how similar our struggles actually are. And so today, I want to invite each of you to participate in this process and to take that step in helping build a more just Miami-Dade. I invite each of you to add your piece to the puzzle. Thank you.